Well, good afternoon and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the inaugural Wednesday lunchtime drive through of the year 2023. I don't know about you, but that sounds very futuristic. Sounds like someday in 2023. Well, here it is. It's 2023. And we want to welcome you back for another great year of the Wednesday lunchtime drive through. We're going to discuss all kinds of wonderful topics this year in 30 minutes every week. And uh, I thought it was appropriate to start with big changes coming in 2023 that will impact your money. And these are specifically changes around certain laws and rules that govern many of the programs and things that you will interact with on your journey into and through retirement. Now, it's important that I say or remind you that not all of these changes that we're going to talk about are going to impact you immediately, but eventually they will, because many of these changes, once they're set, they can be changed again, I guess. These, some of these are laws, and Congress can always change the laws again, right? However, once these things are set, for the most part, it's, it's done, okay? So it may not impact you immediately, but these are things that are going to impact you, if not this year, certainly as we move forward. As always, if you have a question, a comment, anything that you would like to ask or say, you can use the chat or Q&A buttons down in the toolbar. Should be at the bottom of your screen. Just hover over that. You'll see chat, Q&A. You can put your question or comment in any one of those, and I'll certainly share it here with the rest of the group. And uh, of course, I am recording today's session, just like all of our Wednesday lunchtime drive drive throughs If you ever miss an episode, you can go to our YouTube channel, Financial Diva, and you can look for our playlist, the Wednesday lunchtime drive through and you can watch past episodes that maybe you haven't had a chance to watch, and you can watch them on demand whenever you want. All right, so big changes coming in 2023. Now that all the housekeeping and commercials are out of the way, let's just dive right in. So we're going to start with Social Security. Uh, well, actually, here are some of the things we're going to talk about today. Social Security changes, changes to Medicare, retirement plan contribution limits. There going to be there have been some changes to how much you can contribute to things like your 401k or your IRAs. And then the big elephant in the room is the SECURE Act 2.0. It was just passed in the last couple of weeks and signed into law by President Biden. And so uh, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about that. And the good news is that a lot of these changes are positive, at least in terms of how they will impact you. Some of them aren't so positive, or at least they're, they're negatives in terms of, will these help me or will these hurt me? And depending upon how you look at things, most of these will help you, some of them might not, okay? So let's dive in. We're gonna start with social security. So. If you are on Social Security this year, or you're about to go on Social Security this year, Social Security is going to receive the largest COLA or cost of living adjustment in 41 years. The, uh, each benefit, each retiree is going to see 8.7% increase in their benefit. That averages out to an increase of about $146 per month. So you will see those uh, additions in there. It's also important to note that the COLAs, they get locked in, they get priced in so that even if you're not on social security and even if you're not on social security for uh, another few years, those COLAs will also help you over time because it adjusts the entire social security formula and that sort of thing and how they calculate benefits, things like that. It doesn't adjust how you earn quarters of uh, credit, how you earn credit, you still have to work a certain number of hours per year, or you have to earn a certain amount of income, actually, in order to get the four full credits for the year. But remember, the COLAs can also impact you later on in life. So that's good. Uh, we always like to see an increase in Social Security. Now, what's not as good? Now, how is Social Security funded? Well, it's funded by payroll taxes. Every time you get a paycheck, whether you get a W-2 paycheck or you get a 1099 check and you pay self-employment taxes, you are paying tax dollars to fund Social Security and Medicare. So contrary to what a lot of people think, 
You don't have an individual bucket of money that you're pumping your own tax dollars into at Social Security. That's not how it works. It's not like a 401k. The money that you pay in taxes today is going to pay someone's benefit who's on Social Security now. In the future, when you're on Social Security, you're counting on somebody who's younger than you and still working. Their tax dollars are going to pay your benefit. However, what you are accruing is your benefit and your benefit is going to be based upon your 35 highest years of income. But for purposes of calculating how much tax you pay in, it's based upon, they tax a certain amount of your income. Now, in 2022, the first $147,000 that you earned was taxed for Social Security. There's no, there's no limit to how much they tax for Medicare but the first $147,000 was taxable for Social Security. This year in 2023, and this really impacts you if you're a higher income earner, now the first $160,200 you earn is going to be taxed for Social Security. So an additional $13,000 of your income is gonna be taxed for Social Security to fund that portion of the payroll tax. So that's not so good. Uh, now, what if you are about to go on Social Security and you are still working, you still have earned income, and you're younger than full retirement age? Okay, so let's talk about this. There's something called the earnings test. If you are younger than full retirement age, which is anywhere between 66 and 67 under the current law, if you're under full retirement age, you are receiving your social security benefit and you still have earned income from work, the earnings test comes into play for you. And what they will do is they will withhold $1 for every $2 that you earn above a certain amount of money, all right? And in 2022, that annual income limit before the penalty, the, withheld, the withholding began, was just $19,560. So that's not a lot of money. It's, uh, you know, $1,600 a month, something like that. For 2023, the amount of money that you can earn and still stay under the threshold is going up a little bit to $1,770 per month or $21,240 per year. Now, there is something that I've recently learned about this rule, okay? And uh, actually, uh, let's see, uh, Marty, I think you were on the call. Yeah, Marty was on the call. So Marty and his wife, Pam, were in recently, and we were calling Social Security, and Pam wanted to is going to apply for her benefits. She plans to quit working here in the not-too-distant future. However, there may be a period of time that she was still going to be working while she started her benefits, her social security, maybe for a few months. She's younger than full retirement age. So we asked the agent on the phone about the earnings test. Now, it's I'm getting to a point in my in my career where there aren't too many things I hear that surprise me. Okay. But this thing surprised me. I of course was thinking so long as Pam stays under this $21,240 limit for the entire year, she's gonna be good. Well, she wasn't planning to work the entire year, so we weren't too worried about the earnings test, okay? Even if she worked for a few months. However, what we were told by the social security agent is that in your very first year, when you apply for social security, you're younger than full retirement age and you have earned income, they do not look at the total annual amount they measure it every month based on monthly income. And that monthly income limit is $1,770 a month. Now you multiply that times 12, that's 21,240. But for your first year, they don't look at the total year, they look at a monthly basis. And if your income eclipses that monthly amount, you lose that month's benefit and you don't get it back, your social security benefit, you don't get it back. I had not heard that rule. I, I was not aware of that rule. So I, I was kind of surprised. And so were Marty and Pam when we, when we discovered it. So it's important that you know that, especially if you're looking at going on social security, you're younger than full retirement age, and 
you still have earned income. That first year, it's not based on the annual limit, it's based on a monthly limit. So you wanna be really, really sure that you're about to leave your job before you do it. Now, the good news is for Pam, we said, okay, let's start benefits in April. We feel like by then she's going to have left her job. However, one question that we asked the agent, can we call back and move, move the date back a little bit if she's still working? And the answer was yes. So you can make adjustments if you need to. Uh, so wanted to put that little PSA out there. Other changes to social security include higher maximum benefit, uh, more income required to receive the maximum four work credits. I didn't provide all those details. If you want to, you can go look those up. But these are the big social security changes coming in 2023. What about Medicare? So a lot of good news here if you are on Medicare or will be on Medicare. First of all, the Part A hospital deductible is increasing from $1,556 to $1,600. Now, that's not the good news. Now, when you go on Medicare, Part A, for most of you, is going to be free. You're not going to pay anything for the part. There's no premium. For some people, there are. But all these years, you've been paying taxes, payroll taxes, into Social Security, also into Medicare. And so long as you have enough of a um, income history and enough of a work history and you've been paying taxes and you will not have to pay generally a premium for part a which is your inpatient hospital coverage however every time you get admitted to the hospital for an inpatient procedure like a surgery or anything like that you will have to pay a deductible and that is per admission it's not an annual deductible it's per admission and that deductible is going up a little less than fifty dollars You'll also notice that the coinsurance payments for Part A are increasing by 3%. So not only is your deductible going up, but the amount of coinsurance or the sharing of cost that you pay is also going to go up by about 3%. Now, the good news comes from Part B. The Part B monthly premium in 2022 was $170.10. And from 2021, it was $146.10. And then it went to $170. Why such a big increase from 21 to 22? That is because last year, Medicare, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, were considering uh, providing benefits for a new Alzheimer's drug called Aduhelm, which was very promising in clinical trials. And uh, they thought, well, a lot of people may be getting this drug and we want to help cover it. The problem was, is at that time, the drug company that made that drug said, each treatment or the, the cost for that drug was going to be $50,000 per year. So Medicare said, whoa, that's a pretty big expense. We need to build up our cash reserves to be able to cover that. So part of the big premium increase was to adjust for that. Now, later on, the drug company came out and said, well, it's not going to be $50,000 a year. It's only going to be $25,000. So the cost got cut in half. Did Medicare lower the Part B premium for last year? No, they didn't. However, this year they are. And one of the reasons that they are is because they have a large reserve now for that drug and they were able to go ahead and lower the premium, uh, not quite $5, but hey, a dollar's a dollar and paying less is always better than paying more. They also lowered the Part B annual deductible and that decreased from $233 in 2022 to $226 in 2023, and that is an annual deductible. Now, there are several other changes with Medicare, but these are the big ones that I wanted you to know about. And obviously, if you're not on Medicare, these aren't going to impact you yet. But keep in mind, these deductibles and premiums and coinsurance, they change every year. And generally, we find out what the next year's numbers are going to be around October, November. All right. So, we got a ways to go before we hear about the next year. Now, retirement plan contributions. So if you are still working and you are contributing to a plan like a 401k or a 403b, if you are in a church or a nonprofit or a university, or maybe you work for city government, uh, you have a 457b plan, or maybe you're a federal employee and you have what's called a thrift savings plan or a TSP, 
All of these, 401k, 403b, 457, and TSP, are basically mirror images of each other. They function basically the same way. They're just for different types of employers. Starting this year, the total amount that you can contribute if you're under the age of 50 is going from 20,500 to now in 2023, you'll be able to contribute up to $22,500. If you are over the age of 50, you get to add what's called a catch-up contribution and you can, you can add in an additional $7,500. So that means if you're over the age of 50 and you are contributing to one of these employer plans, you can add as much as $30,000 to your retirement plan, 401k, 457, 403b, or TSP for the year 2023. Pretty nice, right? What about adding new money into an IRA? So there are employer plans, but then there are individual plans, IRAs, traditional and Roth. The annual contribution limit is going from $6,000 in 2022 to $6,500 in 2023. There is no change to the catch-up contribution for IRAs in 2023. It's still $1,000. So if you're over the age of 50, you can contribute $6,500 to your IRAs plus an additional 1,000 for a total of 7,500. But if you're under the age of 50, the limit is 6,500. And it's important to note, that is not $6,500 per IRA. That is $6,500 total, even if you've got 50 IRAs. Okay, so that's an important thing that you need to know. Also, the phase outs for deducting contributions to traditional IRAs and whether or not you can contribute to a Roth IRA are going up. So here's what happens with the phase outs. The more income you earn, you lose some of the ability to deduct your contributions to a traditional IRA. That's one reason people like to contribute to a traditional IRA because they get to take a deduction for it. As you earn more income, your ability to take that deduction goes away. And there's about a $10,000 income range. And for every $1,000 you earn above the bottom number, you lose the ability to deduct 10% of your contribution up to the maximum, and then you can't deduct it at all. The same is true for making Roth IRA contributions. If you earn too much income, and there are different uh, thresholds for individual filers and joint filers, if you earn too much income, you will not be allowed to contribute to a Roth IRA. Now, the good news is those income thresholds are going up. So now you can earn more income before these uh, restrictions take effect. So, and you see the notes there that the changes to employer plans impact the major plans, 401k, 403b, TSP, and 457 accounts. Of course, as I said before, if you've got any questions that you or comments on any of that, I'd love to share them here with uh, the rest of the group. Let's continue on. And now let's talk about the big kahuna, the SECURE Act 2.0. So you may recall in 2019, the SECURE Act was passed and SECURE is an acronym. It says setting every community up for retirement enhancement. Congress likes their acronyms, okay? So the SECURE Act of 2019 made a lot of changes specifically to IRA rules uh, that changed how in inherited IRAs are treated. It also increased the age that you have to start taking required minimum distributions. Previous to the SECURE Act of 2019, and really anybody in 2020, because the law wasn't passed until the end of 2019, so it took effect in 2020. Anybody that turned 70 and a half prior to 2020 had to start taking required distributions from your tax-deferred retirement accounts, traditional IRAs, 401ks, pensions, things like that. Starting in 2020, uh, 2020, if you had not yet turned 70 and a half, now you could wait until the age of 72 to start taking required minimum distributions. Well, 72, if you were 70 and a half in 2020, you're turning 72 this year, right? So this would be, should be, right? Yeah, or maybe it was last year. Anyway, the point is, 
This year, the age that you have to take required minimum distributions is moving to 73. So we're gonna talk about that in just a second. So the SECURE Act of 2019 focused mostly on IRAs. The SECURE Act 2.0 now focuses on larger employer retirement plans like 401ks, 403bs, things like that. There are 90 plus new rules as part of this act. And the SECURE Act itself is actually part of a much larger bill called the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. This is an omnibus funding bill worth $1.7 trillion, which basically is Congress passing a law to say we're going to fund the federal government for 2023. And just in case you want to know, well, how big is $1.7 trillion? Well, that's equal to 7% of the U.S.'s total GDP or our total gross domestic product, our economic output. So it costs a lot of money to run this country, turns out. So the SECURE Act was part of that bill, uh, SECURE Act 2.0. So let's start with the changes to the retirement plans. So starting in 2025, so some of these things are immediate and some of these get phased in. So these are in no particular order, but starting in 2025, all new retirement plans, specifically 401ks, things like that, must auto enroll employees. Right now, the default is the employee has to choose to enroll. But starting in 2025, the default is everybody's enrolled and now they have to opt out. Why did Congress do this? Because there are too many people who are not enrolling in their employer's retirement plans. And as a result, they are saving this much for retirement. Back before the 401k was invented in the 1970s, everybody had pensions. So employers were socking away money for their employees. With the advent of the 401k, and it really hit mainstream in the 1980s, you slowly started to see employers get rid of pension plans. And now they shift the risk of saving from them to the employees. Problem is, a lot of people aren't disciplined enough to consistently add money into their retirement accounts. So Congress is stepping in because we have a retirement nightmare on our hands. There are too many people that are not saving enough. The average person who is 60 years old today, do you know they have less than $50,000 saved for retirement? Shocking, I know. For all of you, you're like, what? But the average American who is 60 years old has less than $50,000 saved for retirement. So Congress is stepping in and saying, we are going to force everybody to be in a 401k or equivalent program, and they have to choose not to be in it. Now, to help out those small, especially small businesses, because 401ks cost a lot more to administer than like a simple IRA or a SEP plan or something like that, there are going to be tax credits for startup costs, and those tax credits are going to be doubled for small businesses. Also, starting in 2025, part-time workers who have historically been restricted for participating in a 401k, they had to wait three years before they were eligible. Now, in 20, starting in 2025, the waiting period is only going to be two years. Again, trying to get people to save for retirement, especially younger people, because the younger you start, the better off you'll be later on down the road. Now, here's a big one, especially for you, okay? We don't have, most of the people on our call are not at the beginning of their careers. They're either in the middle or towards the end of their careers. So starting in 2025, people aged 60 to 63 at that time will enjoy an enhanced catch-up contribution of $10,000 per year or 150% of whatever the catch-up amount is that year in 2024 whichever of those is greater, okay? So what does that mean? Well, let's go back here. Starting in 2023, the catch-up contribution is $7,500, right? But starting in 2025, it's gonna go up to $10,000 for those who are 60 to 63 years old and or 150% of whatever the catch-up amount is in 2024, whichever one is greater. So if the catch-up amount is $10,000 in 2024, you're not gonna contribute $10,000. You're gonna be able to contribute 150% of 
of $10,000. So what is that? That's $15,000, right? So that's really interesting, okay? Because again, you're in that red zone. Your early 60s, that 60 to 63, you're ramping up, right? You're gearing up for retirement and it gives you one final chance to front load your 401ks so that you have more money going into retirement. All right, now let's talk about the impact to individual retirement accounts, IRAs. The SECURE Act 2.0 is going to change the way they calculate uh, catch-up contributions, all right? So right now, the catch-up contribution is $1,000, and they didn't change that for 2023, but moving forward, the catch-up contribution is going to be indexed to inflation rather than stay at a flat $1,000, which it's been for several years now. So now you're going to start to see the catch-up contribution for IRAs slowly creep up, and it's going to creep up based on how inflation is moving. All right. So in years when there are as high inflation, like we just saw, you might see the catch-up contribution go up a higher percentage. In years when there's lower inflation, it might go up a little less. But the point is, is now the amount of money that you'll be able to put in if you're over the age of 50 is going to go up incrementally based on inflation. And the big one, RMDs, required minimum distributions. So starting this year, if you did not already turn 72 last year in 2022, and this year you are younger than the age of 72, your age for taking required minimum distributions is now going to be 73. So if you turn 73 this year, well, first, yeah, if you're turning 73 this year, actually, if you're turning 70, then you would have taken them last year. The point is, is if you're under the age of 72 and you hadn't yet started last year, now you get to defer one extra year to 73. But wait, there's more. In 10 years, that age is going to go to 75. So anybody turning 75 in the year 2033 and beyond will have to start taking required minimum distributions. So that's going to impact me. I'm 46. So 10 years from now, I'm going to be 56. I'm still going to be 20 years under that age. Honestly, by the time I get into my 70s or close to it, I mean, the RMD age could be in the 80s by that time. I don't know. So we'll see. Uh, let's see. We do have our first question here. John says or asks, if I retire in June of 2024 at the age of 70, will I be able to work without penalty and earn more than the $21,000? Um, okay. So if I retire in June of 2024 at the age of 70, will I be able to work without penalty and earn more than $21,000? So basically what I, what I think you're asking, John, is will you be able to work and take your Social Security? And the answer is yes, you will. There won't be any penalty because remember, the earnings test penalty only applies if you're on Social Security and you are younger than full retirement age. Well, at the age of 70, you are clearly above full retirement age and you can't let you can't defer your social security any any longer right you must start taking it then so you will not be penalized if at the age of 70 you're still working have earned income and take your social security now what will happen is taxes okay so there's no penalty no earnings penalty but your social security benefit is likely going to be taxed more heavily because the more taxable income you have the more of your social security up to 85% can be taxed. So probably very little chance that you're gonna avoid taxation, but you're not gonna to have to worry about the earnings test penalty. That's a great question. All right, so we answered that one. And if there are any other questions, please uh, let me know. But the point is, is that the age for required minimum distributions is going up again. And for 2023, it's 73. Also, Another big change, the penalty on taking RMDs late is going from 50% to 25%. Now, previously, if you did not take your required minimum distributions by the time you were supposed to, not only were you gonna pay the income tax on the distribution you should have taken, you're gonna pay an additional 50% surcharge on the tax you should have paid. So basically 150% in tax. Well, at least 150% of the tax you should have paid. OK, but now that penalty is going to go down to 25 percent. And if you get it corrected promptly, now the IRS hasn't indicated what promptly means, 
So if you were supposed to take it by December 31, is promptly 30 days, 90 days, six months? I don't know. See, that's the problem with a lot of these laws. Congress can pass them, but it usually takes a year or so before the IRS gives us any guidance on what some of these more nebulous things mean. So I don't know what promptly means, but I would imagine it's probably within 30 days of the end of the year. Then the penalty just goes down to 10%. The bottom line is the SECURE Act 2.0 makes sweeping changes to retirement planning laws. And if you want to know all of the changes, you can go online, you can Google. There are a thousand articles out there about the SECURE Act. I've broken down the simplest pieces for you today. Um, are there any questions before we log off for today? Anybody have any questions that they want to ask? Was there anything that seemed unclear? Uh, was there anything that you've heard and you want some clarification on? Uh, I certainly don't pretend to know all the ins and outs of the entire law. It goes on for hundreds and hundreds of pages. I didn't read them all. I'm sorry. But those are the big things. Uh, let's see. We already answered that question there. I don't see any other questions coming up right now. All right. So here's what I would say is that uh, if a question does pop into your mind later on, I'm going to share my email address here with everybody. Oops. There's my email address. If you would like to email me and you've got a question about something, just let me know. I'm happy to answer it. I want to say Happy New Year again. Thanks so much for joining us for the very first episode of Wednesday Lunchtime drive Through in 2023. I hope you enjoyed it. Plenty more to come throughout the year. Lots of big changes. Of course, one thing we're all tracking is what's going to happen with the stock market. I have no idea. I'm not making any predictions. I'm not going to try to target anything because it's a losing proposition, okay? Because whatever I might think now is going to change anyway. Suffice to say, the first quarter is going to be important because we're, wat we're watching to see what does the Federal Reserve do. Personally, I believe we're going to see rate increases again in February and March. Um, unless the Fed just completely changes course, that's what I'm expecting now. And beyond that, I don't really know, which means it's going to continue to be volatile in the first quarter. Uh, so that's what we have to look forward to. But there might also be a rebound in store for the market later on in the year. We just kind of have to wait and see. It's really still too early to make any kind of call on that at this time. So thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time on the Wednesday Lunchtime Drive-Thru. Take care and stay prosperous.